Well, Eugene, yep. I think that uh, something that we should discuss uh, before yeah. we wrap this up here is something we opened with, and that is, you know, listen, I understand that people are struggling with the idea of people who are under colonial occupation resisting it. And I think that Claudia made a really good point when she mentioned that war is ugly and, and, and the casualties of it are tragic and it is preventable. However, historically speaking, people who are facing settler colonialism, genocide, ethnic cleansing, all of the things that a lot of the things that, you know, Palestinians are facing, um, they have stood up and they have been involved in armed struggle. And in some cases, they've managed to liberate themselves. And so I know that I, I think it's important to raise that history because, you know, a lot of people that we just passed Indigenous uh, People's Day, uh, formerly known as, you know, Columbus Day. I think it still is to some people. Um, but, you know, you will see a lot of like liberals and progressives being like, yeah, we support indigenous rights and settler colonialism was horrible. And we support, you know, the struggle against that and the armed struggle against that because because it was like 200 years ago or 500 years ago or whatever. But we support slave revolts. Uh, but then the same kinds of people today are just horrified if Palestinians are really anybody under assault by imperialism, occupation, colonialism, whatever stands up and hits back. So anyways, I know, I know you had some things you wanted to say about that history that, you know, everybody wants to just pretend was like, you know, indigenous people throwing flowers at, at white settlers or something. Yeah. I mean, I think you put it in the right context of just coming off indigenous people's uh, day or weekend, however you want to look at it uh, here in the United States. And I, I mean, you know, listen, I mean, obviously the the horrors of war are very clear to, to everyone and it certainly can look uh, you know, very callous. But I mean, quite frankly, when you look at this context and this history and why it's important, I mean, these sorts of, of eruptions and types of resistance are exactly what happens when you have a totally asymmetric power balance where people are completely and totally oppressed, where every single you know, law or, you know, a treaty or agreement that's supposed to protect them is constantly violated. And when all the most powerful forces on earth seem to be colluding in that violation, uh, you know, leaving them with very little recourse in terms of how they proceed, uh, other than perhaps, you know, to resist or just to die. And I think that when we look at the history of, of the indigenous peoples, it, this is something that becomes extraordinarily clear. And I, I, I would encourage people really to read the history. I mean, when you look at things like the Powhatan uprising in 1622, which happened in the area of Jamestown, where the Powhatan people whose land was being so heavily encroached upon, they actually started to realize, happened again in the 1640s, by the way, the so-called Third Anglo-Powhatan War, they started to realize, hey, wait a second, these people are not actually here to be our friends. They're trying to take and to steal our land and they will not leave. And every Every agreement we've made with them, they've broken. And in those cases, look at it, the Powhatans versus the English in the 1620s and the 1640s, uh, they had no choice but to stand up and to fight back. And when you see what happened to them ultimately and how so many indigenous people were extinguished and genocided in this country, I think people look back and they say, well, yes, it's, it, it makes sense. I mean, you should look at the Pueblo Revolt of 1680 and what's now New Mexico, where Pueblo people who were living under this brutal, you know, theocratic Spanish conquistador imposed uh, you know, reality where their communities are being totally and completely destroyed. Their culture is being eviscerated just before that revolt. You know, a number of their traditional religious leaders just hanged and executed for not being on board with the Catholic theocratic realities. And those people rose up in what is now New Mexico. And yes, they killed many people when many of them fall into, you know, the case of what we would call civilians. But they also evicted the Spanish from this area for 50 years to protect their cultural heritage and practices that people were coming to destroy in every possible way and to destroy them along with it if they did not fall in line and sometimes even when they did fall in line. You look at the Yamasee uprising of Native Americans as well, but you can also look, as you mentioned, at Nat Turner's rebellion. I mean, I think Nat Turner has rightfully become almost the reference point for slave rebellions here in the United States of America because, you know, what some have deemed the Turner cataclysm was so shocking to slave owners that it, it really rearranged the entire political scene of the United States and entered almost like a new phase of the struggle against slavery. And of course, Nat Turner's rebellion was widely hailed by abolitionists, certainly by all black 
black people living in the North and by, you know, most black slaves. But of course, Turner himself said subsequently that they did in fact use indiscriminate violence in the early parts of their raid and on purpose, because he said they did it to try to strike fear into the hearts of the slave owners. They killed over 50 people uh, in the course of, you know, not that long amount of time. And, you know, they weren't all slave owner, you know, older people or soldiers or whatever. Uh, just read the history and you can see what it is. And of course, when we're talking about the Native Americans, when we're talking about Nat Turner, this was exactly what was said about them at the time, that they're ruthless, that they're bloodthirsty, that they're murderous barbarians, they're animals, that we have to do everything everything possible to kill them, which is why every uprising of indigenous peoples in America was then subsequently used by the settlers themselves to increase their level of violence by saying, look at how, you know, these people are so savage and so barbarous. The same thing with the slave uprisings that we saw over and over and over again. The Haitian Revolution is another great example of that. You know, everything that was being said uh, at the time of the Haitian Revolution uh, towards these Haitian revolutionaries by world public opinion was the same thing. I mean, the term terrorist was in Houston, but they're calling people devils and murderous and barbarous and doing the worst things possible. And, you know, all of that was not false. There was a, a very violent uprising where these slaves, you know, took control of their own lives and their own destinies. But of course, when we look back on that in history, we look back on it differently. We look back on Indigenous Peoples Day and the many positive things that are coming from that. And we say, yes, we need to get rid of you know, for instance, these racist mascots, and we don't want to celebrate this old cowboys and Indians, old Western shoot them up style of American history. And I agree, we should not celebrate that. But we also can't forget that when we think about those old Westerns, and some of us, you know, even when we'd watch those old Westerns, we'd think, man, I wish the Indians could win one of these. Well, when the Indians really did win, they were brutally and totally, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 destroyed from a public opinion standpoint. Uh, and then subsequently, you know, physically and the further offensives that went on. But, you know, when the Indians really won, they were all called murderers and the worst possible people ever. And I'm not saying that to be callous. I'm not saying that to, to both sides it. But I think that it's very easy to look back in history and say, well, it was 400 years ago. It all seemed justified without putting ourselves in the shoes of where Palestinians are today, where they feel like they are in an extraordinarily similar situation, and I do not disagree with them that they are. I mean, you look at the context of what's going on, the total asymmetrical power relationship that they are in, the fact that every single international law that is supposed to protect them is violated every hour of every day, and no one cares, and the most powerful nations on earth actually collude to make sure that Israel never sees any sort of responsibility or accountability for violating things that even these governments say is illegal and the subsequent realities that have come from that. I mean, I, I, we've said it again and again, but I'll just say it one more time here to close to give people a sense. You know, 158,967 Palestinians killed or injured between 2008 and September of 2023 as compared to 6,615 Israelis. Their land is stolen on a regular basis. The settlers who are coming into the West Bank and other parts of this who are just stealing land despite the fact it's allegedly illegal. Olive fields being uprooted. Sewage being pumped into fields so that people are not allowed to farm. The Gaza Strip where people are trapped in the most... Uh, you know, densely populated area on earth without any, you know, water or electricity. Let me read you this, Rania, and this comes from just before this ever happened, from 2020. This is the Washington Post. There's not enough electricity and infrastructure to run Gaza's war-ravaged sewage system. Hostels, schools, homes are similarly running on empty, worn down by the lack of clean water, electricity, infrastructure, and jobs or money. Barely anyone has enough clean water to drink. The only local source of drinking water, the coastal aquifer, is full of dirty, salty water. And I said it before, 500 to 700 children, some as young as 12, arrested every single year. The number one crime is rock throwing. 86% of them report reporting they were beaten by grown adults while in detention. An average of 100 children killed every single year for 23 years in Palestine. I could go on and on and on in places like Hebron, where they're taking people's homes and they seal up their back doors because they say, well, you can't walk into the back alley because Palestinians aren't allowed to go there. This is an Israelis only, which really means Jews only area where you can walk. And that's not to say anything about religion, but it is to show about the religion of the people themselves. But it is to show that the Israeli government is using an ethno-religious, exclusive, apartheid reality. They're dividing the land in every possible way. You know, in Gaza, 45% of people 
who apply to get out of Gaza to get medical treatment because of what we've already heard, that there's inadequate medical care. It's just flatly denied. And for the 55% who are allowed, which includes cancer patients and people like that, you can wait six, seven, eight hours at a checkpoint just to have some teenager, just because they want to have fun, tell you to turn around and you're not able to get your chemotherapy. I mean, this is the daily violence, brutality, death, humiliation, apartheid that people are living under in Palestine. And the fact of the matter is, the reason why there are so many people who can't say that this is somewhat akin to what we've seen with the indigenous peoples in America, that it's akin to what we saw with the slave rebellions in America. The reason they can't say it is because they can't come to terms with that reality, that the project of Israel is an apartheid project that is designed to destroy the Palestinian people in every way possible, to steal their land and impose a reality on them that they don't want and kill them if they stand up or say anything about it. They don't even have to stand up and do anything. And they want to think that that's a just project. It's not a just project. And this is why you've seen, it's not just Hamas. And we, this is, I'll close on this. The whole idea that this is just Hamas is all designed to play into the Islamophobia of Americans, to say it's just a bunch of crazy Islamic radicals. That's why the Israeli forces are now calling Hamas ISIS Gaza. The reality is, is every Palestinian faction, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine, the Palestinian People's Party, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, all of them of various different ideologies, religions, secular and different things are all supporting this 100%. It's why as our colleague Kate Pritzker put out in a recent video why you have almost all of the NGOs in Gaza and in Palestine saying we put 100% of the blame on the Israelis. There's a reason why Palestinians feel united and it's not because they love war. It's not because they're beast and because they're violent and because they're bloodthirsty, but they're in a totally asymmetric power relation where no one anywhere does anything to help them ever. And the people who have the power to change their life and relieve their suffering are complicit in their oppression every single day and the covering up of that crime, which is exactly what we see right now in terms of how many of these Western governments are approaching this. And in that context, just like the Powhatan in Virginia in the 1620s and the 1640s, just like the Pueblo in what is now New Mexico in the 1680s, just like Nat Turner, just like Gabriel Prosser, just like the Stono Rebellion, just like the Haitian Revolution, just like all of those people, the Palestinians are finally saying, you know, if no one is going to do anything for us, we have to do something for ourselves. War is not pretty. Uh, it's never something that is fun, but it is a reality that's here. And people have to ask themselves, which side are you on in this kind of conversation? Conflict. You have to look at those historical precedents. And if you want to say, I value Indigenous Peoples Day in America, if you want to say you value the tradition of black people in America freeing themselves from slavery, then you have to stand in solidarity with the Palestinians uh, resisting their oppression today. And I know a lot of people don't like to hear that, and they don't like to see and hear people have solidarity with resistance, but they have to put it into that context, and they have to understand the 75 years of total dispossession, marginalization, oppression, and exploitation that Palestinians have been subject to with no aid from the outside except from average everyday people.